welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair. having a little discussion about poetry and we're very lucky to have our two poets laureate with this discussion but I'm going to start off um, with our podcasters with Kim and, and Irene and guys is poetry dead if not why do so many people think it is does poetry still matter in today's society Irene I think that a lot of people perceive poetry as dead because they they perceive it as sort of the thing that they learned in school that rhymes, that's an iambic pentameter, and they they just don't perceive that as having um, value in today's society. But there's poetry all around us all the time. I mean, I think that in some ways, uh, you know, that brief uh, wording and, and that condensed wording that we see in social media is a form of poetry. I think that certainly hip hop brings lots of poetry into our world, and there's a lot of really great stuff happening on the poetry scene. Slam poetry is becoming more uh, important and more recognized all the time. And I think that there's just a lot of poetry around us. We have to kind of reframe our thinking about what it is. Well, I think it, it could have been on a respirator for a while, you know, maybe like in the 90s, early noughties or whatever. It was, um, and mostly it, was, it wasn't that accessible to most people, you know, except for songwriting and, you know, some of the things that Irene mentioned. Um, it was mostly academics trying to write for other academics in literary journals, and it just didn't connect as well, yeah. you know, I don't think so. But um, when we were at Lit Walk last year, Edward Hirsch from the States, you know, he's like a National Books uh, Critics Circle Award winner and and president of the Guggenheim Foundation and teacher for many, many years, was talking about how he was seeing a resurgence of interest in poetry in his students. And he thinks that it's partly because it's this generation's way of looking for meaning and connecting, and that, of course, it's more available. Now, he did joke that he wished it wasn't all on Instagram, but he was really happy to see it. And I think the same thing kind of happened to short stories, so I'm hoping that the same kind of comeback will happen for short stories. I mean, they were really popular in magazines until maybe the 70s or so, and then that, those avenues closed up, and they kind of went into the academic journals. And so, yeah, they need to have the same kind of help as poetry has gotten. So. Yeah. Well, Marianne, what do you think? Oh, I think that uh, poetry is very much alive right now, and people are thinking about it more. They, they love narrative poetry. They love the story. They're not used to that. They're used to, as Irene was saying, the iambic pentameter and the perfect this and the perfect that. That isn't what poetry is about, I don't think. A friend of mine just got back from Ireland, and she went to the, to the gravesite of Yeats. Mm. And she brought back for me, and she asked permission, a couple of pebbles from his grave and a, a little booklet of, of his writing. And you know, he, he wrote very much, uh, one of his poems was, Walk softly, you tread upon my dreams. That's pretty powerful. And that's mm-hmm. only two lines. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't rhyme. So I think that, uh, I think when I see the work that Samantha's doing, you know, when I uh, I went to Fog one night and saw what people were doing, I was just fascinated with it. It tells a story, but it's, uh, it's, it brings emotion to people. And like, um, it's, it's just, Rupi Carr is another, mm-hmm. you know, I, The Sun and Her Flowers. I love her just short, short, short work. And I think Haiku is making a comeback. Mm-hmm. Sure. Very, very much. Different forms of making a comeback. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I follow Yates on Twitter. And there's somebody is putting out Yates poetry on Twitter. And, and it's just a nice little uh, coda to my day. So, Sam, what are you finding? I find that, yeah, poetry is very, very much alive. And especially in the youth, it's just taking on a different form. Um, I think that people today just find academic poetry kind of isolating and um, not relatable. And there are... Uh, to put it lightly, there are some issues with traditional canonical writers um, that people are addressing now, but I think that um, the youth today, and especially everyone today, is craving the direct contract, 
contact of, of poetry, and that's why spoken word is so important, and that's why slam is so important. Um, and you see now more than ever these avenues for writing growing on a national scale and an international scale. You can find a poetry slam in basically every major city that you go to. Um, and then I also think that um, it's, it's making a big comeback in the way that people decide to write and publish. Now more than ever, you see more chapbooks coming out, you see more people coming out with their own designs that have to do with poetry, and so it's really, it's really lovely to see kind of um, a return to grassroots publishing and, um, and things like that. I have a young friend who works at um, a very large uh, bookstore chain, and she said, oh, you know, poetry is dead, Sarah. You know, it just doesn't sell. And it's basically because they don't have it there. They just don't seem to, to put it in unless it's Leonard Cohen. But And then and somebody else said, you know, here in Windsor, if somebody reads poetically from the phone book, there will be a good turnout for it. You know, Windsor is a very poetry friendly oh, town yes, and yes. Um, everybody is having a poetry launch somewhere and it's very supportive so I think yeah it's grassroots and it's it's mm -hmm. coming and you know the books sell at those events it's it's like live music now the CDs sell at those events and so nobody earns anything on Spotify but everybody who but comes to the live event buys mm -hmm. the, the merch so from our poets, do you think maybe it's that heightened sense of language that's helping to draw people in? Or what, what is the attraction for a new audience to poetry? I think they can relate to it. I think they can relate to it because I think it's the emotions that it uh, brings out or it reflects. And for example, a lot of people today feel isolated. And so if you go to an event where they're, you know, they're talking about that openly, then uh, people can relate to it. I just think that it, it's got to be relatable, and I think what the, the youth group is doing is it's, it's, they, they get that. They get it, and that's wonderful to see. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think adults do, too. I had a reading the other day at uh, Rotary, mm -hmm. and uh, most of them were not familiar with narrative poetry, poetry that tells a story. And they, they, they just totally enjoyed it. So I think you have to introduce people to what's going on. Yeah, you probably rescued their day. Sort of like, uh, maybe. Oh, I didn't know my day needed poetry, but boy, it did. Yeah. Yeah. I think when you come from an ethnoculturally diverse community like this, too, there are a lot of people who have very strong poetic traditions in their countries of origin. Yes. Good point. And that, oh, yeah. that so leads to a different level of reception of the whole notion of it and a different level of participation. We have so many people in this city who are writing in their own languages, and it's beautiful. You just wish that you could appreciate it as much as, oh, as they do. Mm -hmm. yeah, so maybe it's only dead from sort of that traditional Anglo perspective or that's the only place where you know it might, it might have been struggling there are many yeah perhaps not dead but it like, has its place and yeah. I think Sam had a very good point about you know there's there's issues and and your group of poetry slam very supportive of each other yes yeah. and very open to new thoughts or you know people sort of rip open a bit lay bare their souls and and mm -hmm. uh yeah. you know they get whoops and cheers and because they're out there making art and yeah. and it's doing what they can it's great. Well, Windsor, Ontario is one of several Canadian cities that boast a Poet Laureate program, and we're pleased to have with us Poet Laureate Marianne Mulhern and Youth Poet Laureate Samantha Badoa. Marianne Mulhern, Poet Laureate of Windsor, was a well-respected teacher before she embarked on a second career as a poet. In 2001, she won first prize in the Freedom Festival Poetry Contest with her poem about Harriet Tubman, entitled Freedom's Rail. Mulhern's first book of narrative poetry, The Red Dress, which focused on her experiences living in a convent, was published by Black Moss Press in 2003. Her book, Touch the Dead, was published in 2006 and focused on her life experiences growing up in a cemetery house in St. Thomas. She has published countless poems and seven books to date, including the most recent, All the Words Between. Samantha Badoa is Windsor's inaugural Youth Poet Laureate, as a poet and spoken word artist, she has developed a reputation for excellence at open mic events, and in particular, Windsor Poetry Slam. She has served as a contributor and editor for multiple publications, inclu including the Windsor Salt, the South Detroit Chapbook Series, Sundays with the Tigers, 11 Ways to Watch a Game, the Voodoo Journals, Dispatches from a Haitian Grave, and the Spitfire's Embers. 
So we're very happy to have them with us today. Mm. Uh, Mary Ann, uh, we'll start with you. You um, have just stepped into to being Poet Laureate of Windsor, mm -hmm. taking over from your publisher, Marty Gervais. What does it mean to you to take on this role? Well, first of all, it's a great honor. And it's marvelous that the city of Windsor has expanded the role. Uh, Marty Gervais is Poet Laureate Emeritus, which means he's not out of the picture at all. And Samantha is our Youth Laureate. So I don't have the whole thing upon me. Um, and I give great credit to the city for doing that because most cities have one laureate, and here we have three, which is phenomenal. It certainly shows their commitment to the program, but Marty did an amazing, amazing job as the initial laureate and established that. You know, things like poetry at the manor, like he just, uh, poetry in the schools, like he just made it blossom, and the city recognizes the value. That makes me happy. So I'm really honored, and I just hope I can meet up with Marty's expectations. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about your expectations. I mean, what have you been up to since you were appointed Poet Laureate, and what else are you planning to do while you hold this laureateship? I've been a lot busier than I thought I'd be, but I love it. I really do love it. For example, as I mentioned the other day, I gave a luncheon address at uh, Rotary Club, and I try to support um, literary events whenever, wherever I can, like, for example, attending Biblio Oasis' 15th anniversary last night. I'm, um, I, sometimes I'm asked to, for, oh, the uh, John Muir Lor Library just opened, and I was asked to write a poem about that. So I went to the library a couple of weeks before and got the scoop on the library. And first of all, I have to say that I am so taken with the architect with how he has recreated, he has kept all of the best features of that fire hall. There's a man in my building who worked there as a firefighter and I spoke with him and he said we worked together and he said there was a widow in the neighborhood, we shoveled her snow, we cut her grass and she brought us cakes and pies. Now this is, here's a human interest story that I wove into the poem but I um, I was so thrilled to be asked to write a poem in honor of the John Muir Library opening, and I'm going to be giving a workshop there in November. What these things are, these I think these things are really exciting in the city, and uh, to to keep an old building and to keep the original bricks from the fire hall, and you walk in and and hanging on the pole there is a fireman's jacket mm -hmm. that was worn by a firefighter, and so the history of the building has been kept. They didn't tear it down. Hooray, hooray. You know, we've turned down too many things in this city. Mm -hmm. So, but this, and this architect is so brilliant in his artistic eye to keep, and even some of the flooring from the stable, they had horse-drawn wagons back in the day, 1921, when it opened. And he's kept some of the flooring from the stable and redone it, it's on the second floor. And the old colonial style windows, they're there. They're new windows, but they're that style. So there's exciting things going on in Windsor, and it deserves poetry, and it deserves interest and encouragement. So here we are. Yeah. And Samantha, how about you? What led you to pursue uh, the role of Youth Poet Laureate for the city of Windsor? Well, when I heard that they were creating a position for Youth Poet Laureate, um, I was actually very, you know, excited and happy that they were extending this role. I think that the youth in Windsor um, can be sometimes overlooked in traditional um, literary events, and I thought that it was about time that we have our own programs, our own avenue, our own voice, and I really thought that um, I would like to be the one to help in any way I could. So. And so what have you been up to since you were appointed, appointed Poet Laureate? And like, what are your goals? Like Marianne, I've been, we do a lot of workshops, a lot of readings. Um, I'm creating programming with um, Windsor Public Library right now and the We Trans Center to um, have um, bi-monthly um, poetry workshops and reading events. So I really want to focus on marginalized community, the queer community, and um, I'm working with a couple of local organizations to create programming for uh, Middle Eastern uh, people in the city, which I'm very yeah, which is very passionate, very uh, a culture that is passionate about poetry. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, um, like you were saying before, the um, some of the diversities in Windsor have a very 
a strong tie to storytelling and poetics and the oral tradition. And I really want to see that reflected because of the population of Windsor. So that's, those are my goals. Okay, great. Um, so Marianne, you've had an impressive career as a poet and you've been part of Windsor's literary community for many years. How has being poet laureate changed sort of how you engage with the community? How, is, how does that? Well, it is different because I, uh, now I'm, people approach me and ask me to write poems about, for example, uh, this kind of surprised me, the regional hospital, Windsor Regional Hospital, are doing fundraising for a 3D mammography machine right now. They're hoping to have the machine by January. And it will do early, early detec detection, and it will uh, help women that have dense breasts and women that have hereditary breast cancer. They asked me to write a poem. And I, uh, at first, oh, no, a machine, how do I write a poem about <laughs> a machine? But then I, remem I remembered uh, my sister-in-law, whom I love very, very much, died of complications from breast cancer. And so I could easily engage with the uh, emotional part of that with, with the poem. And then I speak about the machine that will give hope to women who, because of, of their hereditary uh, component, they, it will give them hope because now there'll be early detection and they don't have to worry so much about it. So this is this machine is a big deal, I think, and I was just you know delighted to write a poem about it. There, there'll I think I'll be reading at the when they actually do get the machine at the hospital. There's been several fundraisers, also. So it's it's you're involved in ways that you never thought. Say, so it sounds like part of the role is to give voice to community concerns yes. or community. Yeah, okay, that's that's a very Can cool community thing. projects. Yeah. yeah. So just did you expect that? I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really didn't. I just knew that Mar Marty was a giant in terms of what he was doing, and uh, and when he, they said that he was going to be the poet laureate emeritus, I thought that's great. I don't have to do the whole thing by myself. And then Samantha, mm -hmm. it's even better. So it makes it a lot easier with people that you're working with. So, and Samantha, what are your earliest memories of, of writing poetry? Can you pinpoint a moment when you had that aha, poetry is for me, um, and you realized that you had this, this gift or this desire? Um, well, I think I've been writing poetry basically since I could write, but the big aha moment for me didn't actually come um, until I was in university. Up until then, I had been writing, but um, all I had known was the traditional publishing route and the traditional academic literary route, and I knew that wasn't for me right away. Um, and then me, one night, me and my roommate had pulled up uh, YouTube, and that was my first experience with slam poetry, and right away, I knew it was for, was for me. Um, it's emphasis on storytelling and um, the personal nature and the direct contact you have with people and the ability you have to curate who receives your work and how they receive it and in what environment was very, very important to me mm. um, because the respect around what you put out there as an artist sometimes can get muddled in um, just kind of logistical, logistical, you know, things. So when I saw this YouTube video, that was really the aha moment for me and um, basically that night I started writing as if I would perform on a stage and never really stopped. Oh, so. Interesting. So, yeah. yeah and how does knowing that you're going to perform it in, influence how you write the poem? Oh, it influences it a great deal. Um, when you perform spoken word, and especially when you perform slam, you know that some of these audiences are only going to hear your poem one time for three minutes on a random Tuesday night. And so you tend to lean toward literary devices that um, Sometimes you wouldn't have to. I deal a lot with choruses and um, like one-liners that really pack a lot of punch. Um, and because I know that a lot of these people aren't going to hear my poetry again, I really get to write about what matters to me, and I don't have to worry about um, what's good for marketing in a book and what's sellable and <laughs> um, how to how to package my poetry in a book that's uh, profitable. So I, I really have a lot more control over content and and. How I present myself. So following up on that, this question is for both Marianne and Samantha. Now that you're in this official role as Poets Laureate, does that change what you feel that you are able to say or do as a poet? Do you have to keep it polite and respectable because you're doing this as a public figure? Um, 
I don't, I don't feel that uh, my expression has in any way changed. I really don't. And uh, my audience was probably mostly adults. And so, and I'm used to that, uh, that audience as a teacher. And so it, 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 it's, no, it's not any change, it's not changed for me, really. But I think in Samantha's realm, it really could be. Yes, it has. Um, I find myself um, in some ways uh, censored in just, um, in a way that has to do with audience. Uh, sometimes my poems can be difficult um, and they're not for children. So I've had to accommodate audiences in that way, but also um, I really have to think about what I write because although I do love this city, I am not blind to its faults and sometimes that can be a difficult area to navigate because Although I am a city representative, I think it's important for me to represent the city as it is and not as um, people wish it was. Yeah. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. so it can be tougher to give it a little tough love is what you're... Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, can, I have received pushback a little bit, but um, I think it's important to... Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you have any time, Sam, to um, work on your next project? What's What's your next project that you're working on that's not part of being a Poet Laureate? Um, so I have a book coming out with Black Moss Press. Um, so that comes out in uh, about April. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's, that's what I'm doing now. And I'm always writing. And um, yeah, the Poet Laureate position takes up a lot of my time right now. But a lot of writing and reading. So Yeah. yeah. And Marianne, what about you? Well, uh, things are really busy right now, <laughs> and I, I've got a new book coming out, um, The Midnight Moon Sings of Murder, and it's about the tragic Donnelly family of Lucan, Ontario. I really, as a poet, believe in a sense of place very strongly, and so I have been to Lucan twice now. I've been to the cemetery, and I've been to the actual site of the murders. Their neighbors murdered them. Their neighbors planned those murders, and uh, sadly, I think that the priest was maybe naive or I, whatever. He was complicit somewhat with that because he organized the so-called vigilance committee, which did um, that night. They met at the schoolhouse, which was a stone throw from the Donnelly home. They swore on the Bible allegiance to each other that they would never tell that they had planned these murders. They got drunk, probably on good Irish whiskey, <laughs> I don't know. And they chose weapons. It was a terrible winter night, February 4, 1880. And they went into the, broke into the Donnelly home and murdered, they thought, everyone in the home. Young Johnny O'Connor, a farmhand, hid under a bed. He recognized the voices, he heard the commotion. They put the house on fire and went up the road to murder William Donnelly. Johnny O'Connor looked around and saw the corpses and the house was burning and so he ran into the night to neighbors, Patrick and Ann Whalen. He told his story and they said, at first, we don't believe you. And he said, look out the window, the house is on fire. And then they said, okay kid, this is trouble, shut up. Keep your mouth shut about it. He testified brilliantly in the old London courthouse. But someone circled a, a rumor among the jury that this kid is the bootlegger's son, and you can't believe a word he says. Hmm. And so the verdict was not guilty. And I went to that old courthouse, and I sat in that courtroom. It's now mostly offices, but the courtroom is majestic, majestic. And I sat in that courtroom, and I could almost hear vibrations or echoes of that terrible, terrible injustice to the Donnelly family. A woman who had been um, a fiance of William Donnelly's and her family forbade her to marry him. She was old after the murders and after the court case and she came to the London courthouse every day and said, when will the trial resume? When will there be justice for the Donnellys? And I thought, I, there's a poem about that that I have, but I thought, this story is so powerful. It's just so, and I, my, I'll explain later. The way I've written it is very different. So we'll see. That sounds interesting. What had the Donnellys done to cause all of this anger? I think one of the things that they did is that they were successful. Ah, so it wasn't just anger, it was jealousy. 
There was jealousy. They weren't they weren't golden white livered boys either. There were seven sons. They learned to stand up for themselves very young. They had to because their father was in Kingston for manslaughter for eight years and Johanna ran that farm and she raised those eight kids by herself. So those kids at school, they were bullied and they learned their fists, how to use their fists. They also, William and Robert Donnelly, organized a very successful stagecoach company. People didn't like that. There was the Flanagan Stagecoach Company already that went from Lucan to London and back. They hated that. They hated that. And some of the Donnelly boys had married some of the choice women in the community. So there was a, and the Donnellys got blamed for everything. William Donnelly said, if a stone falls from heaven, it's blamed on the Donnellys. And I think he had a point. He went to the priest and said, this vigilance committee has to end. There will be bloodshed. Then he went to the bishop with the same complaint, but there was no, nothing happened. Except the priest started realizing, oh, oh, what have I done? At first they invited him to the meetings at Cedar House, Cedar Swamp Schoolhouse, and then they stopped inviting him to the, and he started thinking, maybe I've created a monster here, which he had. Mm -hmm. It's quite a story. Yes. That's me. Well, that's a, a great segue because we're going to ask you both to read in the room. Okay. Uh, so this is a poem, um, one of the few love poems I've written. Um, there's a joke among the spoken word artists in Windsor that I always write about my mom and I always write about dark things and I don't have a love poem and every Windsor poem, poet has a sex poem and a love poem. So I said, you know what, I'm going to write a love poem. Um, and this is, uh, I think, my, uh, my attempt to kind of weave in different types of love and how I interpret them in my life. So. I have lost more than I'd care to admit on failed attempts at love poems for people who have demanded them or for people who have deserved them. My hands seem to tremble and my fingers start to seize at the idea of loving anyone like a flower, like an ocean, like anything that is ever written on a Hallmark card, like things that can be contained in ink. It somehow seems very wrong to even try. I've made unwilling victims of these pages in the name of a love poem, and still, I always seem to end up writing about the wrong things, like my mom. I've been told that my mother has no place in a poem to a boyfriend or a partner or a future husband, but it is easy to write about her, and for once, it is easy to write about you. I can tell you about her smile, how it was always seemed like a multicolored acid trip, or about her hands, and how they cradled me in birth and near death with the same gentleness and understanding smooth despite the cuts and burns she acquired through the years or how she always smelt like oranges. And that even now the smell of citrus never fails to make me happy. I can tell you about the days where I am horizontal, chained to my bed, my chest weighed down by thoughts like I'm not good enough and damn, living is hard, how she tears the sheets from the bed throws the window open, tells me I am like the sunrise that comes through the horizon. This is her way of telling me I will be okay. And for the first time in my life, I believe I will be okay on our first date. You showed up at my door with a bag of oranges. Mm -hmm. We sat on a grassy hill and pretended to watch the moon, the pile of peels growing larger behind us as the space between us grew smaller and smaller. And this is how I have learned to love and write about love. When I say I feel about two inches tall, he leads me to a mountain, reminds me how beautiful it can be to be small, how fulfilling it can be to be engulfed by things much older and wiser than we. We spend the rest of the night looking at pictures of space. When I finally do fall asleep, it is in the crook of his arm our chests moving up and down in a unison that only comes with deep and peaceful slumber. I can't sleep without him anymore, and I admit. I have seen stronger women than me drop to their knees because of heartbreak. I have been cataloging their fall since childhood, filing this information away under reasons why not to love, reasons why I definitely shouldn't write about love, but I am ready to drop and fall from grace. I am ready to shed any excuse defense or worry about how we would pick up the pieces if we were ever to break. Being vulnerable is only as scary as you let it be, and I am not scared anymore. This is how I have learned to love him and write about love. Not through blood-soaked pages or empty metaphors, but with orange peels, 
grassy hills, pictures of space and courage. So this is a piece entitled Casper. Um, it's about dealing with body image as a woman. Um, the, I think, pressure on us is uh, unbelievably hard and unsustainable. And uh, how to deal with coming into your body as a woman, and especially for me, as a woman who's almost six feet tall, and <laughs> yeah, and you know, <laughs> thicker, and how to and how to deal with that. So, as a child, I was obsessed with Casper. Casper, the friendly ghost, was not held back by flesh. He was not muscle, plasma, not meat or blood. He was not mortal, carnal, or human. Casper was pleasant. Casper was happy. Casper could float around the world not worrying about sun exposure, health insurance, one-a-day vitamins, or fuckboys. Casper did not have to worry about people, about teachers who told him that a woman's body is only as valuable as the man who wants it, that the men who take it are not to blame, that I am to blame, that my fruit is to blame, that a piece, that my skirt is to blame, that a piece of fruit that is bruised, that is touched, that is fondled, will not be bought, and don't I want to be bought? People without bodies don't have to worry about demons who force you to diet, about distorted funhouse eyes and ravenous mirrors. He did, not worry have, he did not have to worry about puberty, about training bras and tampons, about men's wandering eyes and unwanted touches. Casper had no worries. Casper was also dead, a connection I did not make in my head until I was 16, and the only part of the world I could grasp was the handful of pills in my right and the glass of water in my left. I closed my eyes and said his name like a chorus, Casper, Casper, Casper. I awoke hours later, face first on a carpet I did not recognize, drenched head to toe in sweat, and an orthodox baptism, the unrelenting beating of my heart creating words I did not understand but reminding me anyway that enough women have been discarded, enough of their blood spilled and spoiled to cover all the sidewalks, all of the buildings, the trees, and I would not be one of them, not today. I am learning to love myself, to love my body, to love my own smile, to love the fact that my arms are long enough to wrap around a person almost twice, meaning I give the best hugs, to love that I am uncoordinated, that my limbs move and bounce in every direction and somehow I call it dancing. I am learning to love my stretch marks, my scars, my nooks and crannies and every undiscovered part of me. I am slowly mapping myself taking notice of every crater and constellation on my body. I am looking at myself as I imagine others look at the night sky with wonder and awe. Thank you. My editor, John B. Lee, said, you know, Marianne, a lot of accounts have been written on the Donleys. This has to be unique and different. He said the Donleys brought their young niece, Bridget, from Tipperary, Ireland, a year before the murders. She has been written out of every account. She's going to be a central figure in this book. And so, she was probably about 19, and I have written uh, three sections of the book from her point of view. She comes into Bidolph County, the Lucan area, and lives with the Donnelly family, and she goes to Mass for the first time at St. Patrick's Church. First Mass at St. Patrick's. I braid dark curls, choose my white dress, blue flowers stitched along the hem. People stare, whisper, as if I smell of sin. Father Conley looks away. Maybe he sees the face of Eve or Bathsheba. St. Patrick's Church offers no welcome for Bridget. Another Donnelly denied salvation one kind word, a smile. As I mentioned before, the Donnellys were blamed for a lot of things. And at one point, a cow, a neighbor's cow, the neighbors were named Thompson, went missing from her pasture. And uh, the Donnellys were confronted. No one mentioned that two days later the cow came back. <laughs> Thompson's cow. A neighbor's cow is missing. Men with sticks and clubs 
Members of the Peace Committee swarm over summer grass, accuse Jim and Johanna. I smell hatred, raw as butchered meat. In this poem, Bridget meets her death. Bridget, on a night cold as a virgin's grave, men drag me over floors, buckled with hate. My white nightgown soaks scarlet. Death spills his seed over bodice and hem. Flames claim my body, like a witch chained to a rusted hook in a cattle barn. And I'd like to finish with just one poem about the ghost of Bridget Donnelly, because in the whole aftermath of the murders, Bridget's ghost is present at everything, the funeral, the courtroom, the deathbeds of some of the murderers. So I'll finish with Ghost of Bridget Donnelly. I am the ghost of Bridget Donnelly, released from flames, ashes of youth, never a summer bride veiled in white, a young mother nursing sons. I stay close to my family, land made sacred with blood. Thank you. So interesting. I can't wait to read it. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be a great book. Thank you both very much. Thank you. That was awesome. Good job. Thank you, Thank you, you. Thank you for Fantastic. coming out in the rain. Thanks yeah. for yeah. having yeah. us. Like, it wow. was great. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.